All right. Well, we're going to start moving toward the end game here in our crash course on relational frame theory. And uh, just a quick review of what we've covered so far, because we've covered a lot in a short period of time. In about a half an hour of video time, we have gone from my first video uh, in which we talked a lot about stimulus equivalence and what is, is, what language is, and how we come to infer that if there's a relationship between A and B, then there's a similar relationship between B and A. Uh, and that uh, is the basis of derived stimulus relations, and uh, in turn that um, got launched RFT, what came to be known as the research body known as relational frame theory. Uh, and then in the second uh, video, we took things a little further uh, we talked about stimulus function uh, and that the function of a stimulus in behavior speak is whatever it does to the organism, whatever kind of response it elicits. So <laughs> I use the perhaps unfelicitous um, example of a pile of rotting rodents and that the stimulus function in that case is disgust and we separated between uh, uh, a non-arbitrary stimulus function, which would be if there were a real, actual, stinking pile of dead rodents here, there are some non-arbitrary properties, such as its smell and its look, that elicit the disgust. But my merely talking about it, there's, in fact, no pile of dead rodents here. My talking about it, if it's disgusting to you, that's that would be arbitrary properties of the stimuli uh, involved, the stimuli being my talking to you about it. And I gave some examples using other languages showing how arbitrary and non-arbitrary stimulus properties can become salient under different circumstances, such as whether you understand the language in question, whether you have a learning history uh, to understand it. I'm, I'm breezing through now because this is a review. I would encourage you that if these terms are not solid for you and you would like to really get why RFT is so earth-shaking, I would recommend you go back and review uh, the videos since uh, I, I am not providing much of a review here, just a very brief one. What we're going to, um, ah, what we did in fact move on to is uh, we uh, talked, hello, we talked about a number of different things in the last video. Um, we talked about transfer of stimulus function and how when I have a thought like, I am an idiot, uh, so Joe Reinwein is equivalent to idiot, then um, the... Uh, the stimulus properties of the word idiot transfer from the word idiot as a stimulus to me as a stimulus. And so all the things that the word idiot triggers in me, I will now trigger in myself. A sense of wanting to move away from myself, a sense of looking down on myself and maybe criticizing myself, because I am idiot. Idiot is me. Uh, and then uh, we also, we gave an example, we start talking about uh, to, to make the jump to transformation of stimulus function, uh, which is the more general case of which transfer is a specific case for the relational frame of correspondence. We talked about coin size, which is non-arbitrary, and how a child might choose a coin simply because it's larger. But then if we explain to the child, you know what, the nickel, although it's larger, is more valuable than the dime, excuse me, strike that, reverse it, the dime is more valuable than the nickel, even though the nickel's larger, that would be an arbitrary stimulus property, uh, that there could be a transformation of function, that now the dime becomes more appealing, and that the child might go ahead and reach for the dime rather than reaching for the nickel. And that led to a little bit of discussion of how uh, in relational frames, through these relational frames, the functions transform they don't just transfer, they transform. Uh, that there's transformation of mutual, uh, excuse me, transformation of stimulus function is the more general term. Uh, and that we talk, speak of the functions transforming through the relational frame. In this case, the relational frame 
of value of the coin size, excuse me, value of the coin as opposed to size of the coin. I know I'm tearing through this and mangling it a little bit, but hopefully there's some utility to this review. And um, that then instead of uh, stimulus equivalence, we have mutual entailment. That it's not necessarily exactly the same relationship, uh, after all, because if we're talking about the relational frame of size, then if we say the cup is smaller than the thermos, well, that does not entail that the thermos is smaller than the cup, as we all know. It entails that the thermos is bigger than the cup. And then we had a sort of clinical application where uh, I said, what if I have the thought, you are better than me. So now the uh, relevant terms are you and me, and the relevant relational frame is better than, worse than, or quality perhaps. And that from you are better than me, from that thought, what that entails and what I spontaneously derive is that I am worse than you. And from that I might also infer that therefore I am bad and that those properties of worse and bad may now transfer to me. So that would be a transformation uh, of the sorts from the original stimulus of you are better than me, which could be a thought. Okay. Now, if I haven't thoroughly confused you, you're probably not paying attention. But, from this review, we will now go on to describe yet another property of relational frames, and that is the arbitrary applicability of relational frames. So, that relational frames are arbitrarily applicable, that they show this property of arbitrary applicability. And if we have time, uh, we'll also go on and talk about ironic processes. And that pretty much rounds out the concepts I want to get across to you. If we don't have time, we'll save that for video five, which I think is probably what's going to happen. So um, arbitrary applicability is demonstrable by generating a list like this one, that we have two lists of things. So list of thing one, and then list of thing two. So we're going to have two terms in here and one relational frame. And now just like uh, the old olden days there were Chinese menus of where you pick one from each column. Uh, one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. So we're going to do that and if we were, if I were to close my eyes and at random, just pick at random uh, an object from, from list one, thing one. I didn't look. Uh, and it turns out this object uh, is um, uh, the, the word propeller, okay? And now at random, I'm going to close my eyes and just pick a relational frame at random. It's going to be this one, includes. And then thing two, propeller includes, and then I'm going to pick this one and open my eyes, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. So at random, we selected from a list of uh, kind of diverse uh, things. We selected from a list of diverse relational frames, and we selected at, from a list of more diverse things. And we came up with propeller includes Cleveland, Ohio. Now here's the arbitrary applicability. We can make a story such that any combination has some coherence. We are sense makers. This sense-making function is what we are referring to by the arbitrary applicability of relational frames. So how does propeller include Cleveland, Ohio? Think about it a little bit. You can write a story. So here's my story. A propeller spins, and Cleveland, Ohio's economy keeps going up and down. So things that spin like propellers, include things whose economy goes up and down and gyrates and round and round. Okay, that's a stretch, but it's a story. And if I was very invested in finding a story, I'd find one, even if it's a stretch like that. Let's try another one, especially since that one was such a stretch. Let's see if I can do a, a little bit uh, of a cooler job with the next one. So I'm going to take another random thing here. 
what's this? Uh, breaches, and I'm going to take a random relational frame somewhere on my list here. Breaches is more valuable, and now from my list to another random thing. Breaches is more valuable than yikes. Oh, well, that one's easy. I love brie. Brie cheese is delicious. And saying yikes is unpleasant because usually that's when I'm um, having a fear reaction. I might go yikes. So brie cheese is more valuable than yikes. And so forth. We could take any one of these random, uh, randomly selected nouns, rodent, wax, whoops, rodent, wax, Obama, people, telephone, propeller, um, Brie cheese, any one of these relational frames is, is bigger than, is worse than, is the parent of, includes, is more valuable than, is uglier than, uh, depends on, and we could then have uh, a second randomly selected noun. Yikes, oil refinery, corn husks, Cleveland, Ohio, under ruse, trademark, Chili con carne, or the Phantom of the Opera, we would find, we would be able to find a story such that any of those randomly selected things has that relationship to the other thing. And that's the arbitrary applicability of relational framing. I'm going to take it to here, and in video five, we're going to finish. We're going to talk about ironic processes, and then we're going to talk about how to pull this all together uh, to explain a lot of really common clinical phenomena, such as that of dysthymia, let's say, that basically everything sucks all the time. If we add all of this up, we will see that it is not so hard to perceive everything as bad all the time. Let's see why.